What's up you guys, my name is RBG and welcome back to another Transformers The Last Night update slash trailer analysis. This is a new video segment where I break down all the recent trailers and news regarding TF5 while giving minor speculations on things that haven't yet been confirmed. I mentioned in a previous video that I wouldn't be covering any of the new TV spots or trailers until they've officially been released from the sources in glorious 1080p HD. After waiting patiently, we finally got what we asked for. With that said, I'm gonna be switching it up on you guys. I usually choose two trailers and break them down in a lengthy 20 minute video, but this time around I'm only going to be analyzing one trailer, because I'm pretty sure there's plenty of more of that to come. As a matter of fact, Paramount has announced that they're going to be releasing another Transformers The Last Night trailer tomorrow on June the 8th, so by the time this video is uploaded, that trailer will most likely be out. But anyways, for today's video, I'll be analyzing the Japanese trailer that was uploaded a little over 48 hours ago. That trailer has been getting a lot of buzz around the internet and in my honest opinion it's the best in regards to action and comedy. Everything just feels right, like it doesn't really feel like your typical Michael Bay film that's cram packed with college frat humor and a watered down story. With that said, I've been reading some of your comments on that video and noticed that you have a few concerns and that's in regards to spoilers. A vast majority of you have been saying that they wish they hadn't clicked on the video because they believe that they've been spoiled with a lot of the new scenes. I can see where you're coming from but I can reassure you that there's nothing to worry about. For the most part we've been getting a ton of scenes that have already been shown in most of the previous trailers. Another thing I've noticed is that the team in charge of editing these trailers have mostly been using the footage from the 25 minutes of IMAX screening we got a few months ago. So we're not really getting much. For instance, that funny scene where we see Crosshairs trying to outmuscle Cogman only to get flipped over by one finger was actually already featured in the IMAX screening. The last time I saw that footage the CGI wasn't really polished in regards to the Transformers and it's kind of been a while since I've seen it in general. So now that it's been a while and I'm seeing it with all the finishing touches and extended dialogue, I was still fairly caught off guard to how funny the scene was. As I mentioned earlier, this film is going to have a pretty decent balance of comedy. Like Crosshairs and Bumblebee have some pretty funny moments where they're playing around in little sparring matches and Cogman's going to be this badass sociopathic ninja butler. But anyways, let's start back at the beginning of the trailer because we get more insight on the different generations of Transformers, mainly Bumblebee's origin. If you remember back in my roster update video, I mentioned that Sir Edmund Burton instantly recognized Bee shortly after he and Cade arrived in England. Supposedly, Edmund knew Bumblebee as a child, but for some reason, Bee had no memories of this. Judging from the footage at the beginning of the trailer, we see that Bee served in World War II alongside Hot Rod against the Nazis. I know a lot of viewers are confused because I kept seeing comments like, oh Bumblebee is with the Nazis now, but I can assure you that that's not necessarily the case. What I think it's gonna be is a struggle between different factions. As we all know, there was always this conspiracy regarding the German Nazis receiving help from these quote unquote visitors from other worlds, so I'm thinking they'll probably be allied with some Decepticons while the US soldiers work alongside Autobots such as B and Hot Rod. Now I also noticed that some of the viewers were a bit thrown off, like I saw people saying that they thought Bumblebee was one of the youngest Autobots and if he was around during the 1940s then why isn't he old like Jetfire was in Revenge of the Fallen. I can understand where some of you are coming from with this particular question but let me briefly explain it. A Transformers lifespan is a little different compared to that of an organic being's lifespan. In most cases there's a small minute chance that humans will reach the ripe old age of 100, but with most Cybertronians 100 years is nothing but a millisecond. These guys can live for millions and millions of years without showing any signs of aging. They're practically immortal, but there's a flip side to that coin. In some cases due to Cybertronians being in various conflicts such as war, their aging process can be sped up. Like if they're constantly being upgraded, their new bodies can still be lined and less spry. For example, Ironhide was said to be one of the oldest Autobots being a little younger than the Fallen, but he could move with the best of them. You also have to take into consideration that constant aging could possibly stem from a lack of Energon. Like in TF2, Jetfire did mention that without Energon, a Transformer could oxidize, rust, and potentially perish. But anyways, as to how B lost his memories is anyone's guess. I've researched that Cybertronians frequently forget a lot of things about their past, as if they never happened as the years roll on. So B could have just been roaming around all these years with Hot Rod, just waiting for the right time he could reunite with the rest of the Autobots. As you can see, him and Hot Rod sneak into the Blenheim Palace and get into this epic shootout with the Nazis. Just like some of the earlier TV spots and trailers, you see an extended shot of this soldier jumping out of B's alt mode shortly before he transforms, and after that we finally get a full on frontal of B's World War II invasion robot mode. Now I know that Hot Rod is said to have a Sheetron DS for his alt mode, 
but I don't think that'll be his World War II vehicle mode considering the fact that she trones were manufactured during the mid 50s. World War II started in the 1930s and ended in the mid 40s, so it's most likely that he'll be sporting another vehicle mode. As far as Bumblebee is concerned, I'm not quite sure what type of vehicle alt mode he has. What's funny is that this will be the third evasion mode. In TF1, his evasion mode was this old beat up 70s Camaro. And in TF4, he was a black and yellow modified 67 Camaro shortly before he upgraded to his 2016 Chevy Camaro concept car. So he literally has the most modes of any Transformer in this movie history. But moving on, we see this beautiful shot of Optimus Prime walking into this dark room to meet Quintessa for their first encounter. And then this room would be huge, but looking from that epic camera angle, it looks like it's gonna be on a larger scale than I thought. Just look at the dark scenery and the giant knight statues. Quintessa looks like she ain't playing. In the next shot, we see her throw this epic blue fireball that brings Optimus down to his knees. I'm not sure if that'll have something to do with his heel turn to evil, but this is just a good indication that you shouldn't underestimate her because of her size. Moving on from that scene, we get another epic sequence with Optimus and Bumblebee being plunged from the water of the Mystery Lair. It's pretty much an extended version of the big fight, so there's not really much to go over in that regard. But in the midst of that scene, we get some dialogue from K directed at Optimus where he says, and I quote, This isn't you, Prime. This will probably be the first time Kate sees the now evil Optimus. I'm thinking that he'll try to snap him out of this evil trance shortly before being on the receiving end of our Autobot leader's wrath. Next up, we get an awesome transformation sequence from the Decepticon Lord Megatron. If you've been following the info we got earlier in all the toys, you know that he's going back to his Cybertronian Jet Alt mode. I've been very pleased with this news over the past few months. Like, Megatron should never have been anything else but an aerial vehicle. I can't tell you how many times it annoyed me that he was gradually slipping away from the roots that made him unique. I mean, Megatron is supposed to be known for his flying capabilities, but if he transforms into a rusty Mack truck, that defeats the purpose and that takes away from his character mystique. But anyways, we don't really get a good shot of how the jet looks in motion since Megatron was halfway into robot mode. That's not really a big issue for me because I've seen the toy images, so I can honestly say that I love this sequence and how smooth it is. But I know that some of the fans are a little disappointed. When I looked around in different forums, I saw that people were saying that Megatron didn't transform as much as he just simply mass shifted. That assumption left me scratching my head because I wondered if they even knew what mass shifting is in the TF films. I mean, I can get where they're coming from for the most part, like some of the jet parts sort of disappear or coil up into Megatron's robot form in a weird way. That's not necessarily considered mass shifting. Mass shifting is simply when the editors just change the size of something. For example, in the Transformers 1, Archibald with Wiki's glasses were used to find the coordinates of the cube. What's funny about that scene is how Optimus Prime is easily able to pick up the tiny glasses in his absurdly huge fingers. Realistically, that would be impossible, so the editors had to increase the mass of the glasses to allow them to be visibly seen between Optimus Prime's fingers. This is done a lot with various items, and even the Transformers sizes are increased to fit in well with certain scenes. So yeah, Megatron's transformation may look a little weird, but it's definitely not mass shifting. Moving on, we can see Cade, Vivian, and Cogman heading down into that underwater lair to find this mystery artifact. Following that scene, we see that they've discovered something, and to that, Vivian says, it's real, all of it. And we see her wielding this mystery staff, which is like the same one that was given to Merlin in the other trailer. That's another example of mass shifting. But after that scene, we see these giant Cybertronian knights attack random soldiers. My guess is that they've been lying there in wait and have been ordered to protect the mystery artifact. If you look closely, you can tell that there are two in total. After further analyzing, I'm going to go ahead and speculate that these are the same knights who meet their ends at the hands of Optimus Prime in trailer 4. Moving on to more important shots, we see the Autobot Knight Dragonstorm descend from what looks to be Lockdown Ship or a similar version of it. For those of you who have been following my breakdowns, I predicted that that ship would be in this film from the chomp. Since the last time we saw the vessel, it was hovering around China at the end of TF4. Not sure who's controlling it, but it looks like Dragonstorm may have been held captive in Lockdown's prison considering he's mentioned that he collected all the knights. But I don't know how he was successfully able to apprehend something as vicious as Dragonstorm. If you notice, we get a brief transformation sequence shortly before he flies out. Now I've been hearing speculations about how he may be a combiner of three different Autobots. I'm not quite sure if this is true, but hey, I'm not going to rule out the possibilities. I'm still trying to figure out what the hell this guy is made of and exactly what part goes where because when you look at him, you see all these pointy quills and gadgets. 
But anyways, the last and final scene we have to talk about is the high speed chase involving Bumblebee and Barricade. In my last video, I talked about how the effects team decided to downgrade B back to his Dark the Moon robot mode as opposed to his bulky Age of Extinction one. And that's simply because TF3 had a stealth mode and that's what it looks like he's going to be using in this movie. There's not really much that we haven't already seen in regards to this particular sequence other than this funny moment where we see B's head literally sticking out of his vehicle and looking directly at Cade. Some of the viewers thought this was weird but his head does the exact same thing in Dark of the Moon stealth mode. We just didn't really see him interact with Sam while he was in his vehicle form like he's doing with Cade. Another thing I want to mention before we end the video is Barricade's transformation after he gets blasted. Is it me or does this trailer feature more on-screen transformation sequence than we got in Age of Extinction? I'm thinking yes. My main gripe about the last couple of Transformers films was that Bay and the FX team were getting a little bit lazy with transformations. What's the point of calling the movie Transformers that the viewers don't get to see the robots transform? But seeing this trailer gives me hope that Bay has heard our voice. Hopefully we get a chance to see Hound and Crosshairs transform since we didn't visually see them transform in Transformers 4. But anyways, I want to know what you guys think. Do you think this trailer gave too much away in terms of spoilers? Do you think Bay has learned his lesson and given us a fully coherent story? Let me know down in the comment section below. I asked you guys like or dislike the video. It doesn't matter if it's a thumbs up, it can be a thumbs down. Any feedback is good feedback and will only help me improve on future content. And if you're interested in more news coverage on TF5 or Transformers videos in general, subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay updated. But anyways, this was your boy RBG hitting you guys up in another video. I'll catch you guys later. Peace out. You want to go back? Back to the heart of the war?